and welcome to my channel, Haley Marie Vintage. Today, I have another under $50 project for you guys. This one's gonna involve two pieces, a jumper and a, I guess in an overall, I know jumper means something else in other parts of the world, and then a blouse. So I'll talk about the jumper first. For this jumper, we are using this pattern here, which is Simplicity 7006. I'm gonna need to upsize it just a wee bit, but it's not gonna hopefully be too bad. I'm gonna be doing view A here with a little skirt. I don't feel the need to make another pair of overalls. I have a lot of really great overalls in my rotation right now, but I thought it would be fun to do this guy, which I'm going to do with this light blue kind of denim-ish fabric, but it's super lightweight, so it should be great for spring and summer. I picked this up at $2 a yard and I have two yards so this only cost me four dollars which is why I'm going to be able to stay under that $50 budget and then the second piece will be the blouse that goes under it admittedly I don't know how good of a fit this will be for going under this but we'll see it might turn out different than I expect or better than I expect I guess I'm trying to decide if I want to do the lace version which is version three I do know for sure that I'm going to do the short sleeve version I don't love a dolman long sleeve on me I have made this pattern before this was one of the first patterns I made in like my early sewing journey. I didn't make it on camera. So I have made this before. I do know I like this pattern. The piece that I made from this pattern just was out of some practice fabric, but this time I will be using this really lovely green tulipy fabric. It has all these a tiny multicolored tulips, which just feels so appropriate for spring. I thought these two fabrics would be really cute together. And I think these patterns will also be really cute together. So this will kind of look like two different projects, right? Because I'm gonna make either the jumper first and then the blouse or vice versa. I haven't decided yet. That is, I think, kind of the scoop. I am very excited. I have been kind of wanting to make something with this fabric combination for a while, and the fact that it gets to fit that under $50 category is really exciting because the tulips I picked up at a thrift shop for like six or seven dollars maybe. So I just have a really good opportunity to use some great thrifted fabric and show you guys that you can make really, really, really cute pieces with not that much money. With that, we are gonna hop right into the cutting. First thing I had to do for this project was cut out the pattern pieces because the jumper pattern was factory folded. I personally actually don't care about if things are factory folded or not because I love when somebody else has already done the cutting out work. My paper scissors are such garbage at this point that I probably am gonna get a pair from my favorite brand. Anytime I have to cut out patterns, it is such a nightmare because I don't have good paper scissors. And of course, I'm not gonna use my fabric scissors. Once I finally have these cut out, I am putting them onto the fabric and arranging them and figuring all that out. This is shockingly not a terrible amount of pieces. Even though it is a jumper, I kind of felt for some reason there would be a lot of pieces, but honestly this cutting felt fairly chill, which is great since I have two projects to cut out. This is your reminder that I do have a Patreon and Ko-Fi where you can go check out my monthly memberships. You get access to early videos and polls, and when I remember to, you get weekend updates on what I'm actually working on live. So if you're interested in that, definitely check it out. I have links in the description below. But now I am moving on to cutting out the blouse. I always forget how weird this blouse piece is because of the way the dart is, because it's a like diagonal dart and the folding. And this is just such an interesting blouse pattern. I'm excited to show you all. Uh, I can't believe I haven't made this on camera before. Before starting on this project, I realized it had been a minute since I had changed my needle and cleaned out my machine. So that is my first order of business. I try to be good and clean my machine and change my needle between every project. But let's be honest, it's more like every other or maybe even every three. So this one, it had been a while, so it was really time to clean everything up. Then I'm first going to start by making the blouse. To start, I'm going to interface everything that needs interfacing to get that done and out of the way. This didn't have too much interfacing, needed just the collar and the buttonhole area. And my next step is to connect all my darts and tucks. For this, I do really love the dart and tuck placement for this piece. 
I think it's really nice. I love, I love a tuck for some reason in a blouse. And once those are marked, I am of course going to pin it to get everything ready to sew. After sewing, I am of course pressing. I feel like I say this at least once every video, but pressing is about half the work of sewing and it makes such a difference if you press as you go, as opposed to trying to press everything at the end because it's a lot easier to press things when they're still apart and in pieces. Once the darts and everything are pressed, I am now pressing over. It's like the side that you top stitch down. You'll see in a second what I'm talking about. So to create the little flap that you see in like the pattern, you have that folded over and then you match the back like this. You pin it and then you're going to top stitch it. It's a really, really, really interesting way to create this detail. And I always go back and forth on how I feel on this detail, but I do think it is ultimately pretty cute to have like that extra it's almost like a pin tuck in a diagonal from the collar to the armpit, which sounds less cute when I say it that way. And then for stitching that in, I am using a half inch seam allowance essentially so that flap is going to be a little half inch flap. I believe they actually recommended a 5 8 for this, but I don't know. I just, I felt like that was too flappity flap -y. so here we are. It is totally okay to do your own thing and decide what works best for you in a pattern. And for finishing my seams, I am using my pinking shears. My next step is to focus on the back piece since the front pieces are basically done enough to sew them to the back piece eventually. So first I am sewing the center seam up the back and then the back also has these little tucks so I am putting those in. And with the back all prepped and ready I am now focused on the collar. This is pretty straightforward like most collars. I am just sewing the pieces together. So the reason I am doing some of this prep the way I am is because I want to sit down and hand stitch all the lace on at the same time. So I need to prepare all the pieces that are going to have the lace stitched on it and one of those is the collar This is a step I skipped all the time when I first started sewing some of it was I was just like scared to cut into the fabric like this But for collars or really anything curved that you're turning in it is so important to cut those little pieces Like you see me doing here because it makes a world of difference when you turn and gives you a beautiful look like this looks so nice and you can't get such a nice curved seam like this if you don't clip those seam allowances on the inside. I promise. I know it seems scary, but you will not regret it. I also ended up interfacing the cuffs. I couldn't decide if I wanted to do this initially, but I decided in the end I thought it would be good if they had a little bit extra stiffness to them. And then according to the instructions, I just seam one side of this cuff, which is going to be like the top of the cuff. You'll see what I mean. These are a little bit strange, I guess you could say, for cuffs in the way they're made. But again, I'm focusing on getting these cuffs done because I'm going to hand stitch the lace on again. And once those are stitched, I am again clipping my seams. While this is a very slight curve, it is still a curve. And then I am pressing that open. And then I will be hand stitching the lace on first with the cuffs. I'm having it so it'll be up at the top of that cuff. I will also be hand stitching this lace onto the collar. And then the little pin tuck flap things I made earlier, I am going to cover the top stitching that I made with that with this lace. And once that's done, I can return my focus back to the blouse here. I am pinning the shoulders together, but not yet the side seams. This is important because this makes putting in the collar a lot easier for this type of blouse. And as much as I love to usually ignore these steps, I am first basting on the collar before creating my little collar facing sandwich. A lot of times I just avoid doing this because it's an extra step that doesn't feel like it has a ton of purpose, but I feel like I've been burned recently in some of the projects I've done off camera by skipping this step. So today we are doing this step. And here up in the corner where you barely can see it because I'm really good at my job, I am pinning the facing pieces together. This is just like the front two facing pieces that are attached to the bodice blouse thing and then a little neck piece. And once those are attached, I am finishing up the edge by folding it a quarter inch to give you a nice, clean, beautiful finish at the front. And now I'm doing my facing collar sandwich where I have the collar and then I am pinning on the facing, matching all my notches and seams and all that good stuff. And once I have that stitched, I am going to put in my label because of course I am. I'm trying to be pretty good about putting my label into 
clothing. And with my label put in, I am also going to understitch the collar. Again, I'm just trying to get that really, really nice press. And while nowhere in the instructions does it ever tell you to understitch in the 40s and 50s, they never tell you to understitch when you're supposed to. So I just do it at any point in time I can. And with that all prepped, I get to put in the buttonholes, which I have come to love, which is so funny. I just still think to this day about how afraid I was of my buttonhole foot. Like when I watch this footage, it's wild to me that for at least like three to four months, I would rather do a bound buttonhole than try to figure out how the heck I am going to use this buttonhole stitch. And that is just truly so wild to me. But now with all that prep work done, it is time for me to pin together all the side seams under the armpits. This is always an interesting order of operations. I think it's kind of unique to like a dolman or raglan sleeve to leave the side seams open for so long, but honestly it works so well to let you maneuver well for both the collar and the buttonholes without having to worry about catching those extra layers. And once those side seams are together, I am doing a double turned hem here along the bottom of the shirt. Now it's back to the cuffs. I am first sandwiching the small side seams together to sew those. And then once we have that full circular cuff, I am just pinning it to the sleeve, matching notches, marks, all that good stuff to put in this like faux upturned cuff situation. The reason I call this like a faux cuff is if it was a real cuff, you would fold it up yourself. These are permanent folded because as you can see here, I am then sewing on bias tape that I'm going to use to anchor this then into the inside of the shirt so it looks like a folded cuff even though it is very much a like artificially folded cuff, if that makes sense. And to do that, I'm first cutting down the seam allowance and then kind of doing almost like a double turned hem on the inside and pinning that to hand sew down later so I have my beautiful little decorative cuffs, which hopefully you can see here. At this point in time, I'm also going to anchor some of the facing down to some seams here. I used to just anchor the whole facing, but now that I'm a better sewer and I can get things to press the way I want, I usually just anchor it in a few spots. And then for the buttons, I added these really cute kind of tealish vintage buttons that I think are so cute. It took me a while to figure out exactly what buttons to place with these because there were a lot of like color options from the tulips. And my fray check has kind of gummed over, so I have put a pin in it that now I can't get out, so that was a bit of a struggle. But once that was out, I of course put fray check on all my buttonholes before then cutting them open. And now we're moving on to the 70s, which also means the jumper. So I am leaving a lot of hand sewing behind. There is so little hand sewing on the patterns from the 70s, which I do appreciate. First thing I'm doing here is pinning the front of the bib together. This is both the lining and the outer fabric. They're the same fabric because that's how I wanted it. And then once I have those sewn together and pressed open, I am then doing one side where I'm going to press this up like this because eventually that will be, I know I just said there's not much hand sewing, hand sewn down. And then I get to make my little bib sandwich. Once that is sewn, I am again clipping a lot of corners and curves and seam allowance shenanigans before pressing this out and giving it a really nice like press turn situation. And then once I have gotten a good press there, I'm going to top stitch around the edge. I think this was a quarter of an inch if I recall correctly. This will just help everything like roll and stay nicely since this is kind of like an overall, which I feel like is like kind of more of like a play outfit. I mean, I know I'm an adult, but it's still a play outfit in my opinion. The way the unit construction works with these is you make the front and the back and then you sew them together. So here I am working on the skirt front, which will get sewn up to that bib. The skirt front is a little bit more complex because it does have those pockets. I am getting the front seam all pressed. I do want to note, look at that stay stitching. Aren't you proud of me? I got quite screwed over recently in a project by ignoring the stay stitching. So here it is. And I don't know if honestly this project needed it as bad as the project that I really messed up by not having it. So, but the next step here is to make kind of the front of the pocket. This is like a 
pocket facing combo thing, which will make sense in a second. So I took that facing you saw, I sewed it, I then pressed it so I have a clean seam line, and then I'm doing that quarter inch top stitch, and that creates the outside appearance of the pocket. And right here is an example of a step that I followed even though I had no idea why. So it just had me sew just that tiny portion of the pocket and then completely like press that out while leaving the rest of the pocket very raw edged. Once obviously I got to later in this project why they had me do this was obvious but I was trying to figure out why the heck they had me using like two pieces of fabric for the second part of the pocket. That made no sense to me at this point in time. It then had me go around and baste those two pocket pieces together that I just turned inside out like that which again I didn't quite understand why they had me do this step but I didn't know what I was doing so I was following everything step by step. Sometimes I kind of go rogue and do what I want but when I don't know what is happening I follow the instructions to a T. And here is where it started to become clear for me. So what I'm doing is I'm just pinning the bottom part of the pockets together. Now I can tell that this is going to be where I either have the buttons or the button holes and that's why we needed that clean edge here is it's only from the not clean edge down that will actually sew the side seam and this will give me enough of an opening for me to get my booty through it. So it started to make sense at this point but I had no idea why they were telling me to do the way I was doing until now. Then after stitching those pocket seams that I just pinned together I of course have a pocket but I do want a finished edge so I am zigzagging here. A lot of times I choose to pink seams for like for the rest of this project but here the reason I zigzag is it just gives your pockets an extra level of security. Like if that first stitching for some reason breaks not that this is a huge barrier in your second line of stitching but you do still have something to keep your pockets together until you get around to repairing the hole. And then here I am pinning the skirt to the bib. Everything's matching up. I did everything correctly and the eventual hand sewing I'm going to have to do is already pressed and really ready to go. I will say I think decade wise by instructions I really deeply love the 70s. I think the way instructions are written and the way things come together is really clever and some of that is that they just were less reliant on hand stitching than I would say like the 40s and the 50s. I always feel like when I do these projects from the 70s I learn something new every time. Here I am again, stay stitching, be proud of me. After that one disaster where I ignored the stay stitching, until I've done a pattern once, I think I'm gonna follow stay stitching directions because sometimes it can really bite you and you just never know when it will really bite you if you don't stay stitch. So here it has you kind of stay stitch some corners and things that would be prone to stretching or potentially like you need to clip into and you need the stitching to stop the clipping. But with these weird pieces stay stitched, I have never done a back cross strap like this. I think it's done really cleverly and I like it but I haven't done it. So basically up to a certain point I sewed the center seam and then from there I will I'd be attaching the two straps and you create each piece like that before then attaching the whole shebang. You'll see in a second. Here hopefully you can see more what I'm talking about clearly. So we have that middle thing and then we have the two straps and because of the way the middle thing points the straps they become quite naturally crossed over which is really neat because typically when I make overalls they have not been designed to cross over and because of my very slight shoulders I really prefer a crossed over over all. What a statement. I will say I think I put the straps on these the wrong way which it, it all worked out fine in the end but I think that I as a result we saw a seam at the end that if I had done them the correct way you would have not seen but I don't factually know this because obviously I don't know what this is really fully supposed to look like. And then like the back I am again going to press this over and after pressing it over I will be sandwiching these guys together. And here I went a little rogue. I did not read the instructions. I assumed after getting everything pressed out really nicely, I was then supposed to go around and top stitch it a quarter inch like I had for all the other pieces like this. Nowhere in the instructions did it say to do this and I, as a result, couldn't figure out like how to turn this weird middle crossover part. Honestly, I think that doing this still gave the pair of overalls some cohesion, so I don't like regret not doing this correctly. I definitely was a little, little rogue here. And here I had then read the instructions and read that instead of top stitching the whole thing you were just supposed to top stitch this little like diamond configuration into the straps to permanentize the crossover. I don't know what to even call this step but this was what I was supposed to do before I went a little bit off script. And just like the back this comes with its own set of instructions for the skirt portion. This is of course the easy part where I am just 
just finishing the seam of the middle back, which I am doing via pinking shears before then pressing this open. And then for this, you have to make these little like pieces that jut out that the buttons will lay on that you then put the buttonholes to. This was just a really interesting process and I think really clever. And I love a clever pattern. And the 70s just had some really clever stuff. They had some real terrible stuff too. So I had stitched these little guys and then I am pressing them for their proper like clean edge form. Before I then went and pinned them where... I was told to pin them, which is essentially the like clean edge is down, the unfinished edge is up. Then I will just stitch these in down the side seam, which these I had also basted together, much like the pockets. And then once those are stitched, I pressed them out and I went ahead and I marked my button at this point because I thought it would be easier to do it with these pieces kind of flat and separate than do it after they were sewn together. But once the button things were marked, I then pinned the bib and the, I guess this is not a bib because it's the back. You know what I mean. This piece and that piece, I pinned the raw edges together, leaving that cleanly pressed thing that will eventually be hand stitched down. And now I am pinning the side seams together. Each of them has like a part that sticks out kind of weird. You can see the little flap here. It's just, this is an interesting construction that I thoroughly enjoyed learning how to do. And then I'm of course cleaning up these edges with some pinking shears, much like everything else before pressing everything into place. And then I'm putting in the buttonholes. The buttonholes go on like the pocket front side, which makes sense because you don't want it to come from the back side because then people can see in between the slits through the buttonholes, if that makes sense. So I am stitching those buttonholes in. I have chosen these really cute, very old brown wood buttons that I have. And then I am fray checking my life away because we do have 10 buttonholes here. And while I was waiting for the fray check to dry, I sewed on these buttons. The nuance of these buttons will not pick up on camera, but they're really, really beautiful. Older wooden buttons that have, it's like this very subtle ridging to them. They're super nice. And I'm hoping that they hold up okay on a garment like this. And then here I'm doing the little bit of hand stitching of the bibs and back thing down to the seam to get that all closed up. And then once I tried these on, I got the placement for how I wanted the little shoulder overall snaps to work. And I'm now hand stitching that down as well. Now I'm gonna open these buttonholes. So the reason I'm doing all of this right now and you haven't yet seen me hem is I need to try this on to figure out how much I need to hem it. With that all finished up, I now figured out my hem. I cut off about an inch and a half of this because it was sitting like right where it would sit awkwardly across your knee. And for me, I like something to either be underneath my knee or above my knee. So I chopped this so that way when I did a double turn hem, it would be nice and above my knee. But with that, I am going to show you the reveal. I'm so excited to show you this cute little outfit I put together. It is so spring and so fun. So you've seen the reveal, I headed out to one of the really pretty waterfront parks that had a ton of daffodils, so I hope you enjoyed that. We are firmly sort of into spring, I don't know, it's also been kind of freezy and weird out, so I don't really know what season we're in, but of course I have plenty of things to talk through with the costs and all that jazz. 
For costs, I will say these didn't end up in total under $50. They are under like 75-ish. Both items are under $50 technically to make. So I'm gonna say I still did what I said I would do in this project. I didn't check how much the pattern for the overalls were and it was expensive. So it ended up not quite working great for this. I need to be better about checking how much patterns cost before I actually sew them for these projects. As far as fabric for the jumper, that was $6. And then notions, the buttons, the thread, all that jazz was $8.09. And then the pattern, which like I said, this pattern was really expensive, was $30.32. I love this pattern though. I can tell you already, I'm gonna make a whole bunch more of these. So it will get plenty of use and it will get cheaper per use. So that brings me to supply total of $44.41 for this piece. I think that's a great price for a piece like this. It's incredibly versatile. I'll be able to wear it with a ton of different things. And hopefully it will help me get better use out of like my blouse collection that I've been slowly growing. Um, as far as labor, Honestly, this didn't take me that long and I think it's because it isn't a ton of hand sewing. This took me six hours and 30 minutes, which I just, I don't think is too bad for this cute little jumper dress. I feel like half of that was sewing buttons. So with that, as always, we pay a living wage here on this channel and in Seattle, maybe right now, I, I've talked in the past, I'm gonna try to probably adjust these numbers again. That is $35.39 an hour. Multiplying that by six hours and 30 minutes is $230 four cents, which brings us to a grand total for this piece of $274.45. As usual, disclaimer, this is not a one-to-one -one of factory production. Obviously, factories have this down much quicker than I do, although this time I did not make silly mistakes, and since I didn't do a lot of hand sewing, we also have, I guess, that as a bonus of not skewing the price maybe as much. As far as the blouse, Plus was pretty cheap to make. It was $8.36 of fabric. And then the notions, buttons, and thread and trim and interfacing was $6.58. I got most of those things secondhand, so that's how I'm able to pull off these prices. And then the pattern was $7.30 because I have used this pattern twice now. This is the second time I've used this pattern. So I took the total I spent on the pattern and I divided it by two. So that is a full total of $22.24. I know you can get stuff cheaper than that from fast fashion brands that are button down shirts, but generally for a structured collared shirt, $22.24 feels like a pretty good price and this is so high quality and also super unique and special with a lot of great details. And then the blouse, which is so interesting, it took me six hours. So the jumper only took me a half hour more than the blouse, which seems just kind of wild to me. And I'm gonna multiply that by $35.39, which is $212.34, which brings me to a grand total of $234.58 on this blouse. Like I said, as always, these costs are not equal, directly comparable shenanigans, but I just think it's important to think about the time and labor that goes into clothing, because no clothing is actually sewed by robots, all are sewn by human hands, and often the people sewing our clothes are treated and paid really, really poorly. And it's been interesting to see, there's been some movement in the government kind of starting to talk about this. I will be fascinated and give you guys any further info as hopefully we maybe get to the point that something somewhere is gonna be passed. So I can tell you where to help support measures to fair wages for our garment workers. But anyway, I wore this to work today. Right before the reveal, actually, one of my buttons broke, which that is the bummer of using vintage wooded buttons. I have like a little half thing. You could have caught it in the reveal. Luckily, I have one spare button for this, so I will sew that button on and really hope that none of these others are gonna break. I think the other ones will be, oh boy, that one has some cracks in it. Is that this one is like super cracked. It's like surprising I maybe even sewed it on. But uh, the other buttons are looking okay, but I do think I will need to take the buttons off this to wash it, which is not the most fun, which also I have to wash this pretty soon. I don't know what I was thinking. I was cooking yesterday with turmeric and that is now on the front of this dress, so there's a huge chance it stains. If that's the case, I might just go ahead and dye this darker to try to cover that because I think this would still be really cute as a dark situation, but yeah, I am nothing if not a mess. I feel like I'm constantly wearing these for the first time and staining them. Aside from getting turmeric curry all over this, I was super comfortable in this dress. I will be wearing this a ton. Even honestly, if it's stained, I will still be wearing this a ton. I feel super cute in it. As far as the sewing overall, I think I did a great job on the sewing. The only thing to note is this back 
diamond I don't think is that cute or that I did a great job on that and some of that is I got carried away and I did top stitching places that they did not request top stitching but I think it's okay because honestly it matches more of the other parts of the garment even though it resulted in like this weird curly cue over here I think it's an okay thing other thing that didn't go the best is I don't know why I cannot get overall buttons to go in nicely but I cannot for the life of me get them to go in nicely so these are kind of like crooked and weird and I have definitely hit the buttons kind of weird and they've kind of squished as far as the pockets the pockets in this are really nice they're pretty deep I can put my phone and wallet and keys in them and that is what I ask for pockets last note on this it's a little bit short which is totally fine I'm just not used to wearing shorter clothing so I think there is a world where I make this and I lengthen the skirt a little bit for just a different type of look this is a very 70s look with it being right above the knee but I think sometimes I'm going to want it below the knee because that's kind of generally more my style I'm pretty happy with this I am so excited that I finally sewed up this pattern and gave it a good test so hopefully I can now make a bunch more of these now as far as the blouse I love this blouse I adore this blouse only critique is I think I needed just a little more space in the sleeve I feel like it's kind of hugs my shoulder here so I just need to do some research on how to fix that from a dolman sleeve I honestly suspect it's your usual slash and spread method just giving myself a little bit more space there I think would be nice yeah it just it's a little mild fit issue and yeah otherwise I have no complaints about this I do think the trim maybe gets a little lost in the rest of this blouse which is a bummer with how long it took me to hand sew this on however it's fine it's not a huge deal I really like this collar and definitely I've just gotten significantly better at sewing things like this. The collar has one tuck that it's not supposed to. Let's see, do I have any more? Uh, two, which is not bad. They're both really mild tucks. This is an area that I, uh, the easing of the collar into the neckline is always pretty challenging for me. So I'm pretty pleased with the two very small tucks I have going on there, which is funny because I just made a blouse, I think a week ago, two weeks ago on this channel. And that actually has a lot more tucking issues than this one. So I think that this shows a good improvement. I am so happy with this project and again I think it shows that you can sew really really beautiful garments for fairly affordable pricing because I don't think people would look at these pieces and think they are as cheap as they were to make. And one of the bigger points of sewing in the past at least was it used to be more affordable than buying brand new at the store. That will never be true right now with apps like Shein and Timu. However, what you buy there, you get what you pay for, and it often won't last through washes. And we just don't wanna be taking up earth resource with disposable garments. We need to be wearing our garments more often. And I think I'm gonna get a ton of wear out of these pieces. But with that, I am gonna go ahead and go out in the sunshine and live my life. As always, you can support me by going over to either my Patreon or Ko-Fi and supporting me via monthly membership where you'll get access to early videos and exclusive polls. And then of course you can support me the free ways by giving this a thumbs up and commenting down below. I always appreciate your guys' comments and often I get great, very insightful feedback on my videos and I really truly do appreciate it even if I am the slowest person ever to respond to them. And of course, if you have made it this far, be sure to subscribe for more sewing shenanigans. I have a, another sewing project coming up in two weeks, but between that and now I will have a fun little vlog of a vintage store miniature convention and getting my hair to this beautiful coloring. So stay tuned for that and I will see you next week. Bye!